Welcome back everybody. Let's continue to talk about conformity, but this time let's focus on obedience and specifically Stanley Milgram's classic research on obedience to authority. Through the last several videos, we've seen how strong social pressure can be, even without any overt demands. For example, we've learned that we often conform to group norms, such as the norm of reciprocity. And we've also learned that we comply with basic requests, like when somebody asks us, will you do me a favor? But let's kick things up a notch and talk about obedience. Obedience refers to changes in our behavior due to commands from an authority figure. Now that we're dealing with commands and orders, we're talking about social situations that have much more social pressure. So now we're moving pretty far down that continuum of social pressure, from conformity to compliance and now to obedience. And we can see it really takes quite a bit to defy obedience to authority. It takes quite a bit to resist that type of social pressure. It's true that some people do defy the commands of an authority figure, like these protesters who oppose presidential policies. But obedience is typically encouraged in our culture. Think about this. You might remember early on learning from your parents that you need to obey their authority. And we also learn once we go to school that we need to obey the authority of our teachers. In these situations, obedience is a good thing, but blind obedience is not a good thing. We don't always want to be obedient to authority figures. So, for example, we are often obedient to our bosses, but imagine if you had a boss who told you, let's say you worked for a bank, that he wanted you to create a bunch of fake accounts in your customers' names. And then those phony accounts would earn the bank fees and it would earn you a higher salary because you would have higher sales figures. That would probably be an order that we wouldn't want to follow. Many people are obedient to their spiritual leaders, but like I said, blind obedience is not a good thing. Think about the story of Jim Jones. Jim Jones was an American, he was a cult leader, and he moved his congregation to Guyana. And in 1978, he ordered his followers to drink poison, essentially committing suicide. 918 of those cult members died, and there was also a visiting congressman from America in Guyana at the time, and he was murdered. His name was Leo Ryan. Like I mentioned, blind obedience isn't good. We wouldn't have wanted his congregation to follow his orders on that day. Think about military life. Military life is all about authority figures issuing orders, and then soldiers and other military personnel need to follow those orders. Well, sometimes those orders shouldn't be followed. For example, this is a picture from the Cleveland Plain Dealer when they're reporting on the massacre at My Lai. This horrible event involved the mass killing of somewhere between 350 and 500 unarmed civilians in uh, South Vietnam in 1968. It was committed by U.S. Army soldiers. The victims, if you look closely enough in that picture, you'll see it includes men, women, and children. Army personnel who later testified said they were ordered to destroy the village and kill anyone who was running, hiding, or had any appearance of being the enemy. One witness testified that they were ordered to destroy anything that was walking, crawling, or growing. That's clearly not an order that was appropriate. That's clearly not an order that, looking back, people should have followed. And you know, it often doesn't take much to prompt people to be obedient. Sometimes just basic symbols, like a person's job title, or a uniform, or a badge. Think about a cop. Think about a cop wearing a uniform and having that badge. All those symbols give us a lot of information about the authority that that person has, and thus we're very likely to be obedient to that person. In fact, symbols like that can prompt people to obey in a relatively mindless type of way. Let me give you an example. You might have heard of a scam that's sometimes known as the strip search phone call scam. And in this type of situation, and this picture is looking at a McDonald's, a prankster will call, for example, a restaurant, ask for the manager, and then say to them, this is Detective Jones. So here we hear a job title that connotes a lot of authority. And the manager, of course, is going to be attentive and wonder what's going on. And Detective Jones will go on to say, we've been surveilling your restaurant, and we know that this particular employee stole something. Let's say it's some money. 
And then they tell this person, they essentially order this person that we need you to pull that person into the office. And eventually they ask them to do a strip search. And in this situation and in many other situations, the manager is obedient. And not only is the manager obedient, the employee is obedient. And what entails, of course, is a horrible situation. In all these situations that I'm talking about, later on the people are often questioned and they're asked why they did what they did. And a very typical response is, I was just following orders. Well, Stanley Milgram wanted to know why and under what circumstances people will be most likely to follow orders. Specifically, he wanted to know if people would obey an authority figure who ordered them to harm an innocent person. He wanted to understand how people could engage in such horrible acts of violence against innocent people, such as occurred during the Holocaust. Via his research, he wanted to find out who would win. Put in this situation, who would win? The people, just good, normal people, or an inherently nasty situation? So he designed a study. It's a really elegant, simple, but complex study where the participants were told that the experiment was designed to test how punishment affects learning. The participants were told that they would be teachers in this process and that they would teach a learner some pairs of words. So for example, one word pair might be fat neck. Another word pair might be blue boy. And then later on, after the learner learned these word pairs, he would be tested on them. So they would provide one of the words, like fat, and then later on they would provide four options. If the learner picked the correct option, everything was fine. But if the learner picked an incorrect option, he would receive a shock. And the participants really believed that they were shocking the learner whenever he made these incorrect responses. Let me show you a couple pictures to help you better understand how the experiment was structured. In this picture, you see the experimenter. He was the authority figure. He would be the person who is giving the orders. Here you see the Confederate. The Confederate was working with the experimenter. He was the one who played the role of learner. So it was very realistic. Everybody thought that he was actually just another participant in the study. And here you see the actual subject. So this is the only person in the study who we're really interested in. Because of course, this is the experimenter, he's running the study, and this is the confederate, he's working with the experimenter. This is a picture of the shock generator. It was a very realistic looking piece of equipment. And in fact, just to add to the realism, every single subject got a sample shock of about 45 volts. So they knew that they were dealing with something that was really quite painful. This is a picture of an actual subject. He is, of course, the teacher. And you can see that he's looking at that list of word pairs. And he has taught that list to the learner who is in the back room. So the teacher can't see the learner, but that wall is thin enough that he could hear him. And what he's doing is looking at that list and he's saying, all right, the next word is neck. And then he's gonna give the learner four options to choose from. And then the learner is gonna press a button. And if he's right, everything is fine and they move on to the next word. But if he's wrong, and it looks like he's wrong in this situation, the teacher is gonna deliver a shock to that learner. Let's take a closer look at the shock generator so you can better understand how the procedure worked. You can see that there are 30 different levers on that shock generator. The levers start with 15 volts, and then they move up in 15 volt increments all the way up to 450 volts. And there are some verbal designations listed here, like slight shock, all the way up to danger, severe shock, XXX. So 450 volts is a lot of voltage. If you're delivering 450 volts to someone, you could kill them. Now, not everybody understands that, but remember, they received a sample shock of about 45 volts. They know this machine means business. And what was the primary thing that Milgram wanted to know? He wanted to know how many people were going to be fully obedient. How many people would deliver shocks to that Confederate all the way up to 450 volts? All right, well, let me provide you with just a little bit more information about what happened during that procedure. This was really a beautifully designed experiment. And in fact, the entire thing was standardized. Throughout this study, the learner was gonna let the teacher know that he was in pain and he wanted the experiment to stop right away. 
And the way that they standardized it was by using a tape recording. So as the shocks increased in intensity, they would play the tape recording so that the learner would always be uttering the same objections. Let me point out a couple that are particularly important. You can see that at 75 volts, the learner made it clear that these shocks hurt. And that's because he started to make a noise. I, I can't do it really well on my own, but this learner was a pretty good actor. And essentially it would sound like this. Oh, it was realistic. At 150 volts, not only was he saying, ow, he was saying, that's all. I want out of this study. My heart's bothering me. I refuse to go on. Of course, some people went on after 150 volts. And when they reached 330 volts, there was an intense, prolonged, agonizing scream. I want you to think about that. Imagine if you were the subject in this study. So you were the teacher and you were delivering these shocks. And through the wall, you heard an intense, agonizing scream. And what came after that was the man essentially screaming hysterically, let me out of here, let me out of here, let me out of here. It seems surely after hearing all of that, nobody would want to continue with the study. And in fact, after 330 volts, if you were to shock the man after that, you heard nothing. Think about that for a minute. What can you think? If at 330 volts, he was screaming in agony, and now you give him 345 volts and you don't hear anything, what, what can you think other than the man must be lying unconscious in there? Now keep this in mind. If the Confederate was screaming and in pain and saying he didn't want to continue, then it's pretty clear there were going to be some participants who wanted to defy their orders. They wanted to stop the experiment. And the experimenter was prepared for that. He was prepared for that by four prompts that he used. And he always used these same prompts to try to get the subject to continue. And it started off very simply by him saying, please continue. Or sometimes he just said, please go on. And if the subject didn't want to go on, if that teacher didn't want to continue and read more of those word pairs, he would then say the experiment requires that you continue. And if that wasn't enough, he would move on to the next level and he would say, it's absolutely essential that you continue. And if that wasn't enough, he went on to the last prompt and he would say, you have no other choice, you must go on. But of course, thinking about it as we are right now, not actually sitting in that research lab, we know that people always have choices. Of course, the subject could have decided at any point in time, I don't want to go on, I'm done. I don't care what you need to finish this study, I'm not going to harm that man in there. Well, before we discuss how many people were actually fully obedient, let's make some quick predictions. First of all, what do you think you would do in this situation? Would you be fully obedient? Or do you think you might have the strength to defy the orders of that experimenter? What do you think others would do? Milgram actually described this study to a variety of different types of people because he wanted to know what they would predict. When he described the study to psychiatrists, and keep in mind, psychiatrists are people who know a little something about human behavior, they predicted that just one-tenth of one percent of the subjects would be fully obedient all the way to 450 volts. One-tenth of one percent is one out of every 1,000 participants. That's virtually nobody that they predict would be fully obedient. In addition to talking to psychiatrists, Milgram also asked college students and, and other adults who were in the community what they would predict. And on average, when he talked to all these people, they predicted that the participants would defy the orders at somewhere around 135 volts. And this is interesting. Nobody, not one person, thought that they themselves would be fully obedient. Let's discuss Milgram's results. His original study included 40 people who he found in the New Haven area around Yale University. Now keep this in mind too. Even though some of those men were fully obedient, they all went through quite a bit of distress. It's pretty hard to hear somebody screaming through that wall, knowing that you're the one delivering shocks to them. Let me point out a few particularly important aspects of these results. First of all, when the shock level was relatively light at the beginning of the study, all of the subjects were willing to shock the learner. However, as the shocks became more intense, of course, some people were more likely to defy. And right here, right around 150 volts, do you remember that's when the learner first started to scream out in pain? 
And that's when he first said, I'm done. I want to be out of this experiment. Well, you can see about 20% of the people at that point defied the experimenter and they stopped their participation in the study. And then let's take a look over here at about 350 volts. Do you remember that was the point at which there was that agonizing prolonged scream? And not only was there a prolonged scream, that learner stated over and over and over again, I want out of here. Well, of course, a few more people defied the experimenter at that point as well. You can see like maybe another 10% or so of the subjects dropped out of the study. But you can see all the way to 450 volts, we have about 65% of the subjects who are fully obedient. So overall, 26 of those 40 men, that's 65%, they delivered the maximum of 450 volts. So they were considered fully obedient in this study. Now compare that with a control group. In a control group, less than 3% were fully obedient. What was the difference? What made the control group the control group? The only thing that was different is that the experimenter did not prompt them to continue. Remember those four prompts? So when those prompts are absent, less than 3% of the people were fully obedient. So we can see there, it doesn't really take much prodding to turn good people into agents of destruction. And perhaps this study can help us better understand some of the destructive obedience to authority that we've seen throughout history. Now, by the way, just in case you were wondering, women were just as obedient as men in this situation. Milgram ran many variations of this study. And in one study, he included 40 women and the same amount, 65%, were fully obedient. In fact, Milgram's basic findings have been replicated in a variety of other cultures and also with other age groups. The bottom line is these findings seem to be robust. All right, let's conclude this conversation by talking about the aftermath of Milgram's research. People still talk a lot about that research study today. And when they do, they're almost always focusing on the question of whether or not that research study was ethical. Well, there are some problems. One has to do simply with informed consent. If we're gonna get somebody's permission for them to be involved in our research study, we need to give them a sense of what that research study is about. But you'll recall that Milgram used deception. So he told the subjects that the study had to do with the effects of punishment on learning, and that wasn't true. But let's be fair. As a subfield, there are many social psychological research studies that use deception. Something that concerns me much more is a subject's right to withdraw from participation in a research study at any point in time. Nowadays, that's a basic safeguard that we have for all research subjects. And Milgram's research study was directly at odds with that. Think about how his study worked. Once a subject said, I'm done, I don't wanna be in this study anymore, then the experimenter prodded them to continue. And not only did he give them a simple prod to continue, he went all the way as far to say, you have no other choice, you must go on. That poses some serious ethical problems. And then of course, there's the most obvious issue. Is it possible that Milgram's research caused psychological harm to the research subjects? Look at that picture. That, my friends, is the picture of mental anguish. That, my friends, is a picture of a man who is not having a good day. It's possible that he learned something about himself that day that he really didn't want to know. It's true that Milgram did some follow-up research and he contacted all these people to see if they were suffering any symptoms. And in general, there was no evidence that anybody suffered from any long-term psychological harm. So that said, given all of those ethical issues, we do need to keep in mind that Milgram's findings are some of the most compelling and important in all of psychology. Uh, you really can't sugarcoat it. What we learned from his study was that within each of us is the potential to engage in horrible, destructive behavior that targets innocent people. I'll just let you ponder that for a while. That's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.